Today, I will be teaching you guys how to understand frame data in Tekken. Personally, I feel that learning frames is one of the best things you can do for yourself. When you understand how frames work, you will know the underlying mechanics of Tekken and why certain things always happen the way they do. This will result in you becoming a more solid player that uses fundamentals and basics to consistently win matches. So let's get started. This video is broken down into five chapters. What are frames? The three types of collisions, applying frame advantage, recovering from frame advantage, and the gray area of frame advantage. A frame can be defined as a picture or as a unit of time. When you show many pictures together sequentially, you have an animation. So basically, every move in Tekken is a pre-made animation that you trigger with button inputs. Usually, fighting games run at 60 frames per second, meaning that each frame is 1 60th of a second, or 0 0.0166 seconds. But because that's not an easy number to work with, we talk in terms of frames instead. We can use frames to describe the attributes of an attack. Every attack in Tekken, from a simple jab to powerful uppercuts to weird looking rocket blasts, have three phases that they always go through. Starting with the blocking position, first is your starter frames, then your active frames, then recovery frames, and then back to blocking. Startup frames refer to how fast an attack comes out. You generally don't want to spam slow moves. That's why it's good to know your character's fastest attacks, so you can use them as safe pokes. Active frames refers to how long an attack is invincible. Active frames are usually very fast, and it's hard to react to, so you don't need to be concerned with them that much. Just understand what we mean by active, and you'll be good. Recovery frames refers to how long it takes for you to safely block again. Technically, you are always recovering from any action in Tekken, but some types of recovery are so small it's negligible. The most notable ones you will encounter are recovery on block, on hit, and on counter hit. Now that you know the three phases of every attack in the game, let's derive three equations to represent the three most common collisions in Tekken. When active frames collide with active frames, you have a trade. When active frames collide with starter frames, you have a counter hit. And when active frames collide with recovery frames, you have a punish. This is basically how you inflict damage in Tekken, with the exception of clean hits, pokes, and throws. Let's analyze the first type of collision using frame data. A trade is when active frames meet active frames, meaning that two moves have the same starter frames, resulting in both players getting hit. You can think of it in terms of a race, where both players reach the finish line at the same time. In the case of Law's down forward 3 versus Asuka's forward 2, both moves require 17 frames to become active. After blocking Asuka's 2 plus 3, which is plus 0 on block, if both players mash on their respective moves, they will both start up at the same speed and both become active on the 17th frame, resulting in a trade. The second type of collision is a counter hit. A counter hit is when active frames meet startup frames, meaning that you interrupt your opponent's move while they are starting up. In this case, we have Law's 4 3 plus 4 going against Xiao Yu's Hypnotist Dance unblockable. It's pretty easy to visualize this in terms of frames. Law's 4 3 plus 4 simply starts up faster, faster by 84 frames. Counter hits are basically what make up the majority of Tekken matches. They can be hit confirmed, but most are done by accident. The most common way to be counter hit is to think a string is finished when it really isn't. Most counter hits can be very fast and look exactly like a normal hit. The difference is that counter hits inflict more damage than a regular clean hit or poke. Counter hits can also change properties of an attack, turning them into launchers. Although they aren't super high in the air, the counter hit still makes them have airborne properties, allowing you to juggle them. The third type of collision is called a punish. A punish is when active frames meet recovery frames, meaning that you attack an opponent while they are recovering and vulnerable. This is the most dependable way to inflict damage because you can react and confirm a punish. There are three types of punishes, block punish, whiff punish, and sidestep punish. The first situation you see here is an example of a block punish. Asuka does her 4-2 which is blocked, putting her at negative 20 or 20 frames of recovery. In this recovery state, she is totally vulnerable and cannot block at all. Law can respond by getting guaranteed damage with a move that starts up faster than 20 frames. Let's use his 1-1-2 string and see what happens. On the 10th frame, Law has already reached his active state, while Asuka still has 10 frames of recovery left, meaning she cannot block and thus has no choice but to receive damage. Because of these 10 frames of leeway, Law can go for more damage by punishing with slightly slower moves. As long as it's faster than 20 frames, it will be guaranteed. 
However, know that there is only a window of opportunity here. What do I mean by this? Notice that when using his 10 frame punisher, Brian can start mashing 1-4 as soon as possible. Or he can wait a bit and still punish. But if he waits too long, then Asuka is able to recover and go back to her blocking position. Another thing that complicates punishing is the issue of directional inputs. This is Brian's 16 frame punisher. This is his 17 frame punisher. And this is his 15 frame punisher. But it didn't work, even though it is technically faster. The culprit is in this while standing notation. Having to crouch, then let go, then input the 1 takes up valuable time. And even worse, I can't buffer a while standing motion like forward forward 4. So if I do it too slow, Asuka will be able to block. This is why while standing moves are generally reserved for when you block a low attack or when you are in a forced crouch position. But if you really want to punish with a while standing move, then you need to do an instant while standing motion. It is semi bufferable and it comes out much faster. Here's another example. You can easily punish Lars's up forward 3 with a 10 frame jab. But to really send a message, you want to go for a heftier punish like a 15 frame launcher. This requires you to react to the unsafe move and punish as soon as possible. If you hesitate even a little, the punish will not be successful. Also, keep in mind that if you notice pushback, you might have to opt for longer range punishers that may or may not launch. But hey, it's better than nothing. Therefore, the closer the gap between the startup of your punisher and the recovery of your opponent's moves, the more alert and sharp you have to be in order to make a successful block punish. In a real battle, if you find one move doesn't punish, adjust and go for your faster moves. It's all about adapting and experimentation. In some cases, knowing how to block punish correctly can open up damage opportunities that you didn't even know existed. On the flip side, punishing incorrectly can sometimes mean the difference between life and death. The second type of punish is a whiff punish, which is when an attack completely misses and just hits the air. Here, Asuka is at even more of a disadvantage than if she had a 4-2 blocked, because Law has no block stun recovery at all, so he can punish immediately after seeing 4-2 whiff. Just don't wait too long or else Asuka can recover and block. Whiffing is never safe. Whiff recovery is even worse than block recovery, and against someone who is good at whiff punishing, whiffing a seemingly safe move means that you can be punished severely and almost instantaneously. This is the reason why smart and controlled backdashing is talked about so much in the Tekken community. It is important to stay at the optimum range for your character, and to whiff punish when you are ready for it. Each character has a range that they whiff punish most well in. So the name of the game is to dash in and out in an attempt to stay out of your opponent's range while keeping them in your range. Therefore, never backdash just to show off. Instead, always do it with a purpose in mind. Another way to induce a whiff is by ducking. For example, Lee's 4-2-1 and Brian's quarter circle back 2-4 are both mid-high strings. So once I recognize the mid or the beginning of the string, I can buffer my crouch input, dodge the high, and then retaliate with total confidence. Just know that not all strings are duckable. The third type of punish is called a sidestep punish, which is basically a non-linear whiff punish. By sidestepping into the foreground or background, you make the opponent's attack whiff not in front of you, but to your side. The benefit of sidestep punishing is that you can dodge some really long range attacks, as long as they are linear attacks with weak tracking. Plus, there's the added chance that you can walk to your opponent's back, letting you do unbreakable grabs in long strings. And similar to ducking strings, sidestepping strings is a very effective strategy as well. There are two types of lateral movement, sidestepping and sidewalking. Sidestepping covers less distance, it's less evasive, but it's safer and faster. The fact that it's faster lets you dodge things at the last minute, since you can just tap up or down. Sidewalking covers more distance, is more evasive, but is less safe and slower. The fact that it's slower means you usually have to buffer the up up hold input if you want to sidewalk successfully. Each type of lateral movement has its uses, so use both. There are a few more intricacies to size that punishing, but we'll get to it in the 5th chapter.
Frame advantage is the reason why Tekken is not a simple game of two people taking turns attacking and blocking. If your opponent is good, they will either continually apply pressure or on the flip side, be able to stop you from applying pressure to them. Frame advantage is when you make your opponent recover at a slower rate than you. This makes frame advantage a relative term. If one player is at advantage, then the other player has to be at disadvantage. We denote this relativity by saying someone is at plus frames or at minus frames. Minus frames is the same as saying you were put in recovery. Plus frames is the same as saying you put someone else in recovery. Depending on whether you block an attack, get hit by an attack, or get counter hit by an attack, the frame advantage that you gain or lose can change as well. So let's see frame advantage in action. Here, Asuka does 1-3, which is minus 1 on hit, and then follows up immediately with a jab. After getting hit, if Law mashes on 3 plus 4, he will always lose to Asuka's jab. In other words, he will be counter hit. However, if he answers back with a jab of his own, then he will win. Why does this happen? Once again, if you analyze it frame by frame, you will see the answer. The one frame of recovery I mentioned earlier sounds minuscule, but if she chooses to continue her offense with her quickest jab and Law retaliates with his quickest jab, Law will win because he becomes active one frame faster than her. This time around, Asuka gets counter hit. Essentially, at disadvantage, Asuka's 10 frame jab becomes an 11 frame jab. This can be counterintuitive, but whenever you see plus frames, subtract it from startup frames because you have to be faster. Whenever you see minus frames, it means you have to add to your startup because you have to be slower. If you gain nothing from this video, at least remember this method of calculating frame advantage. It's very useful. Therefore, for Asuka, 1 frame of recovery plus 10 frames to start up equals an 11 frame move. For Law, 10 frames to start up minus 1 frame of advantage equals a 9 frame move. But there's an important thing to note here. This does not imply that all of a sudden we have a 9 frame move versus an 11 frame move. It is either 10 frames versus 11 frames in the case of Asuka, or 9 frames versus 10 frames in the case of Law. The 10 frame move acts as a sort of reference point for you to confer advantage. Remember what I said earlier about frame advantage being relative. Frame advantage can also change the type of collision that usually occurs. For example, at point blank range, if Law does Legend Kick and it gets blocked, he is at plus 3, meaning Asuka is at minus 3. Now what happens when both players mash on their 17 frame move? Earlier we saw a trade, but that was only because both players had an equal starting point. This time around, Law is in the lead by 3 frames, and conversely, Asuka is behind by 3 frames. Therefore, when the two moves start up, Law will be faster and be rewarded with a counter hit. We can see this play out in the game. When you do the math, 3 frames of recovery plus 17 frames to start up equals a 20 frame move. So does this mean that if Asuka does a 14 frame move against Law's 17 frame move, it will become a trade? Yes it will. Because a 14 frame move is faster than a 17 frame move by 3 frames, it compensates for the 3 frames of recovery that Asuka already has. This time, 3 frames of recovery plus 14 frames to start up equals a 17 frame move. Only by doing a move that is faster than 14 frames will Asuka land a counter hit. Well now the law player is going to think to himself, I don't have to do a 17 frame move. I could use my quickest mid like down forward 1 to lock her in place. And he would be right. Being a disadvantage of around negative 3 to negative 11 and then being attacked by a quick 13 frame mid like down forward 1 limits Asuka's options greatly. But there are ways out, we'll talk about that in chapter 4. Now sometimes, the frame advantage is so good you are guaranteed damage afterwards. This is why some knockdown moves on hit have combo extensions because recovery is relatively fast for the attacker and slow for the opponent. Other moves cause an unbreakable stun on hit, also allowing for a combo extension. Asuka's forward crouch down forward 2 on counter hit actually gives her 18 frames of advantage, which is exceptionally good. With good execution, she can crouch cancel into her forward 2 launcher for massive damage. Haorong's right stance forward 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 3 is even more scary. On block, it gives so much frame advantage that he can follow up with the 2 back plus 4, even if the opponent is blocking as much as possible. It is a very scary setup, which is why you need to always avoid blocking this move at all costs. Duck it instead. Law's Legend Kick is a little bit less scary. He is only guaranteed damage if Asuka neutral guards. 
This is known as a guard break, or GB. Holding back to block solves this problem. The thing with frame advantage is that you can't apply it out in the open. You have to be up close and have your hits connect for the frame advantage to exist. So what happens when you are playing against someone who likes to run away, block, and employ keep away tactics? If you don't have the life lead, then you don't really have much of a choice but to run after them. But it can be dangerous going against someone that spams back sway moves and crush moves all day. The answer is to do nothing, or rather pretend to do something while really doing nothing. To pull this off, you will need smooth and controlled movement, a combination of backdash, sidestep, and forward dash cancels to bait out a reaction from the turtler. Once the turtler makes a mistake, you punish accordingly. Do not underestimate this tactic, it is very powerful in the right hands. If they're still keeping up their defense, you can throw in feints, cancels, and delayable strings to confuse them. These moves are actually pretty unsafe. I don't recommend you do these against aggressive players, but against someone who is overly defensive, it can be a great option, especially if they like to fuzzy guard. Overall, frame advantage is like a tug of war between you and your opponent, with each person trying to get the flag of advantage on their side as much as possible. But there's no use gaining the advantage if you don't do something afterwards. In other words, you have to take advantage of that advantage. Use that forward momentum to get a favorable trade, get counter hits, apply pressure, get throw setups, or mix up with hooks in order to win the round. Most of the time, being at disadvantage does not mean your opponent is guaranteed anything. Your opponent can have all the frame advantage in the world, but if you don't press buttons, then technically, you aren't in danger. It is very simple. At any point during a match, when you are put in recovery, four things should be going through your mind. Should I start blocking, start attacking, start avoiding, or start adapting? Pick the right action at the right time, and you can possibly turn the odds in your favor and get out of the difficult situation at hand. Knowing when to block is very important. Generally, you do not want to press buttons when you are at disadvantage. The classic example is blocking a generic while running 3. If that huge stun animation is not enough to scare you into not pressing buttons, then at least you should know that on block, it gives your opponent around 6-9 to nine frames of advantage, depending on how late it hits. Even if you are mashing out your fastest 10 frame jab, the 6 frames of disadvantage will make your 10 frame jab a 16 frame move. Your opponent can easily counter hit a 16 frame move. A common trick from martial law is to throw out 4 up 3. If it hits, then great. But if it's blocked, they will follow up with an insanely quick down 2 3, which starts up in 10 frames. There's something about seeing a somersault that just makes people want to punish it, and the law player knows this, so he follows up with one of his fastest moves to interrupt them. The while running 3 and law's 4 up 3 situations are examples of frame traps. A frame trap is when you execute an attack with considerable frame advantage on block or on hit and trick your opponent into thinking that it's safe to press buttons afterwards. Frame traps are essentially planned counter hit setups. They are not guaranteed, but they have a very high probability of being successful, especially on the first try. There are other times when you can't respect your opponent too much. They could have some frame advantage, but they might not know and use a very slow attack afterwards. Sometimes, mashing out your fastest attacks can act as a good way to prevent your opponent from gaining momentum he or she doesn't deserve. Say for example, Elisa does her back 3 plus 4, 3 plus 4 bound move, and I block it. Many people would just freeze up and let Elisa have her way. But what I always do is mash while standing 4 to challenge Elisa and put her in check. Most of the time, while standing 4 is very effective. Or we could even take the law frame trap from earlier and turn it into an offensive situation. Brian can mash his 10 frame down 2 and challenge law's down 2 3 for a trade. This is a more unorthodox example. But if Eddie gets into his relaxed stance, the person standing is put into a position where they have to react against a mix-up or else they'll be sweeped off their feet or be counter-hit lunged. Therefore, using your quickest lows is a good way to disrupt the relaxed stance and tell the Eddie player you aren't going to tolerate his shenanigans. After blocking something and being at disadvantage, another option is to avoid your opponent's follow-up moves. This usually takes the form of some type of movement, either backdashing, sidewalking, ducking, or jumping. Knowing how to avoid strings usually involves seeing it before, or reacting on the spot. 
For example, both kicks of Nina's 4-3 gives massive frame advantage on block from plus 6 to plus 7, limiting your options and giving her an opportunity to start her offense. Why give her that chance when you can duck the first kick, make her whiff the second one, and punish? Ducking is very fast at a 1 frame startup. Or perhaps Haorong rushes in and gets a successful down 3-4, which is a natural combo in plus 14 to plus 16 on hit. You can stay still and try to block, but then you are at the mercy of these scary string mix-ups that can go on forever. A better alternative would be to block the initial hits, and wait until you have enough advantage to backdash and sidestep away. Finally, if you are faced with relaxed stance, some form of jumping is another good option too, as it is fast and has evasive properties. Learn how to avoid strings. It can really make the game easier for you, and make you feel less trapped all the time. When I say adapting, it can mean any of the things I mentioned previously, but it can also mean other things that don't fit easily into the category of attack, block, and avoid. These things include attack counters and stun recovery. Attack counters can branch off into two categories, reversals and parries. Reversals are when you catch an opponent's attack and reverse it back on them, usually in the form of a throw. Generic reversals can actually be reversed again. This is called a chicken. They also cannot reverse knees, elbows, and other unorthodox moves. Parries are when you deflect an opponent's attack, gain some frame advantage, and possibly a free follow-up. Parries can be broken down into more types. There are generic mid-parries, generic low-parries, punch-parries, and sabaki-parries. Generic mid-parries can deflect high and mid-attacks. Generic low-parries can deflect low attacks and put your opponent in a bound state. Punch-parries can only deflect certain highs and mids. They can't deflect running threes, for example. Sabaki-parries can actually eat an opponent's attack and let you do your own attack if timed correctly. This makes them more like reversals in a sense. By setting Law to do a block legend kick and follow up with his fastest attacks, I have been able to come up with rough estimates of how fast reversals and parries are. These are my findings. This leads me to believe that some of the best attack counters can start up at around 1 to 7 frames. Even the slowest ones are relatively fast, so they are all useful in one's defensive game. So why would you want to do attack counters? Well, it's great for when you know an attack in a string is coming, so you can avoid being trapped further in disadvantage. This makes attack counters great for stopping 10 string combos. It's great for when block punishing is not possible or grants little rewards. For example, blocking double jins down back 2 is great but it's only negative 12 on block. Your while standing punisher doesn't compensate for all of the down back 2s you might potentially eat later on. That's why you should low parry it instead, as this yields more damage and can dissuade double Jin from abusing down back 2. And finally, attack counters are generally a good thing to use at moments of huge disadvantage. Even if your opponent has plus rings, there's still a chance you can still parry, so take some risks. Now why wouldn't you want to do attack counters? Doing it at the wrong time makes you extremely vulnerable. This can easily happen if you spam a reversal or parry. Your opponent can catch on and bait you into doing it. Attack counters also can't stop every attack in the game. For example, lasers. A more common example would be grabs. Surprisingly, you can't reverse crouch jabs either, but because crouch jabs are special mids, you can low parry them. A final point I want to make is that there are times when low pairing is actually disabled. This is probably to stop people from spamming down forward inputs. For example, Asuka's down back 4 series can be low parried at any point on hit, but this is not the case with King's low kicks. One kick must be blocked first before you have enough recovery to low parry. All in all, pulling off smart attack counters requires a good read on your opponent's patterns and tendencies because you have seen it before or are used to it. It also requires you not to abuse it just like any other attack in the game. Another method of adaptation is in stun recovery. You should always be breaking and recovering from these stuns. Don't let your opponent get away with these. The double over stun is a classic example of a stun that can be caused by a generic delayed jumping 3. In second tag 2, holding back to block breaks the stun. It's very simple. The nosebleed stun can be induced by someone like Yoshimitsu or Nina, who have the poison breath attack. 
For this stun, holding down breaks the stun. However, it only decreases your hitbox, so you still have to take a few points of damage. But it is better than eating a full combo. And then there are grab stuns, like Xiaoyu's 4 2 plus 3, making you stunned and in the back turn position. The moment you realize that this grab is taking place, hold down to break the stun. Let's talk a bit about Okazemi, the mind games between a grounded opponent and a standing opponent. There isn't really frame data out there that goes into detail about Okazemi, but I like to think about it in terms of frames. This is because, when you're getting off the ground, there are initially some frames where you can't block, meaning you're in recovery. Therefore, there's always a risk to how you get up, so be smart about how you go about it. For example, if you do nothing and stay still, you'll get hit by a grounded attack. If you side roll, you can get hit by a tracking low sweep. And if you quick rise, tech roll or back roll, you may get picked up for a combo. With regards to get up kicks, they have their uses for countering aggressive opponents, but they are still pretty unsafe. And depending on how you are laying down, the frames of your get up kick on block can change. Generally, get up low kicks are more unsafe than get up mid kicks. And what about handsprings and rolling dives? A get up handspring can be hard to counter hit because of the back sway, but it is easily whiff punished, sidestep punished, and block punished. A get up rolling dive is impossible to block punish, but it is easy to counter hit and can be whiff punished and sidestep punished with good timing and movement. Finally, we get to Tag Crash, which is safer than the previous methods, but not as safe as you might think. Tag Crash also has recovery frames that you can exploit if you know how. For example, you can jump back and make a whiff. You can backflip and make a whiff. You can sidestep and punish. You can also parry it with Wang. And you can even block punish with Yoshimitsu. Yep, I said block punish. Probably the safest methods to get off the ground are quick back roll and quick handspring from a knockdown, but it is not common to be granted this situation. So the lesson is, there's no consistent answer for how to get off the ground. It depends on your opponent and how you adapt to them. Just keep an open mind and be creative. One of the most important lessons to take away from this video is that frame advantage and frame data in general is very helpful, but it is not something that you can count on 100%. There are many factors in the game and outside of the game that can make frames a bit fuzzy and ambiguous. We will cover some of these factors in this chapter. Depending on how far you are from your opponent, the block frames of attacks can change drastically as well as change the way hitboxes interact. For example, at close range, Asuka can punish Paul's death fist effortlessly, but if you put some distance between them, let's say range 5, it will whiff, giving Paul a chance to launch you. Therefore, knowing what moves can be punished is important, but equally important is knowing the range of your punishers, because there's always the chance that some moves have weird pushback properties. Some attacks can also become meaty when you add distance into the equation. Meaty attacks are when an attack connects on its last few active frames, resulting in even more frame advantage. At the closest range, Law's Legend Kick is plus 3 on block. At the farthest range, however, about range 5, Legend Kick is a whopping plus 11, so Asuka can't even reversal. Here's another example. Xiaoyu can parry Law's jab after blocking Legend Kick from about 3 back dashes away. But if she blocks a Legend Kick from 4 back dashes away, her parry will become too slow, on account of Law's frame advantage. Just like in real life martial arts, some moves are done in such a way that they dodge attacks and attack at the same time. This makes some situations more of a rock paper scissors scenario. A low crush beats lows, but not highs. A high crush beats highs, but not lows. Mids generally are not crushable, but some mids can be crushed by stances like AOP. You don't have to input a crush at the exact right time either. There is a generous crush window that will eat up your opponent's attacks so long as the conditions for a crush are met. 
The crush system makes frames less important while making spacing and hard reads more important. These examples prove it. A crush can be successful even if you are at a disadvantage. Many people do not like the crush system, but personally, I feel that it helps to lessen the occurrence of floor counter hits and it gives you a safe way to option select out of tough situations. What if I told you that it's not always a good idea to attack after having frame advantage? It's good to apply pressure, but you should do it in moderation. This is because the 3D aspect of Tekken needs to be taken into account. Lateral movement, aka sidewalking slash sidestepping, takes 6 frames to execute, which is extremely fast. Therefore, even with say 9 frames of advantage, if you get too confident and follow up with a move 15 frames or slower, your opponent can step you, making your move whiff entirely. Using the frame advantage map we've been applying, we can see how this is the case. A 15 frame move minus 9 frames of advantage equals a 6 frame move. A sidewalk being 6 frames is just fast enough to fit the bill. Now what if you get greedy and try to do your 16 frame, 17 frame, or 18 frame moves? It's a bad idea because they can definitely step you and punish you for it. The gray area refers to the range of frames where block punishing is non-existent. Because the fastest generic block punisher is 10 frames, the gray area is therefore having frame advantage or disadvantage from minus 9 to plus 9. In this gray area, both players cannot punish each other, but they can however sidewalk each other. This leads to a whole new world of mind games, because now you're not just worrying about trades, counter hits, punishes, and grabs, you have to worry about being sidestepped and launched. But ultimately, someone has to make a move after blocking a save attack, and what are the dangers of doing so? Let's look at a table of blocked attacks and follow up actions. For the sake of clarity, you are the attacker and the opponent is the defender. This table shows the situation where the attacker gets his first move blocked, is at plus frames, and immediately follows up with another move. Note, this information can also apply if the attacker lands his first hit. To analyze this table, you take the frames of the first move and subtract from the speed of the second move. This will give you your frame difference, or your window of opportunity to sidestep successfully. Any follow-up move that has at least a 6 frame difference from the frame advantage means your opponent can sidestep you. Here the attacker tries to mount pressure and is punished for it. I want to put a special emphasis on plus 4 and below, because even with a nice 4 frames of advantage, if you mash in your fastest 10 frame jab, your opponent can still step you. From plus 5 and above however, mashing out your 10 frame jab will be the sidestep, so that's good news for the defender. If the attacker wants to sidewalk plus 5 and above, he will need to condition his opponent to throw out something slow like a 13 frame down forward 1. How does one do this? Well, you will need to first teach them that it's not okay to throw out a high jab. In this example, Yoshimitsu does a no sword stance 3 slide 4, which is minus 5 on block. If Jin does a high jab and Yoshi ducks and flash punishes, Jin loses more than half of his health. Chances are they will not want that to happen again, so they'll probably do a mid the next time around, giving you a chance to sidestep and launch. So as you can see, the gray area can help out the attacker as well as the defender. It just depends on how you interpret the situation. Who has the advantage? Who decides to make the next move? And who decides to sidestep afterwards? Now don't be too scared by this. It is called the gray area after all, so nothing is guaranteed. After blocking a safe attack, if both players don't do anything, there's no danger, and the match goes back to what is called a neutral game. Knowing about the gray area just serves to help you know why your linear moves are whiffing at point blank range, and how you can use that to your advantage. And there are some exceptions to this principle, for example, tracking moves. If you use a quick mid with tracking, you can potentially catch a sidewalk, rendering the gray area obsolete in a sense. The same goes for quick tracking lows. Also, the direction of your sidewalk can also determine if you successfully evade your opponent's moves. Finally, distance also plays an important role in determining how successful your sidewalk is. The farther away from your opponent, the easier it is to sidewalk, even if you're at negative frames. Overall, the gray area can get confusing at times because it's very relative. Who's the attacker? Who's the defender? Who has the advantage? Who has the 6 frame window? In a nutshell, this is what you should take away. Don't be tempted by a small amount of advantage and attack immediately after. Your opponent could be planning to sidestep you. 
In conclusion, frame data is a great thing to learn because it opens up a world of guaranteed options. But as you have seen, not everything is guaranteed, and just because something is guaranteed doesn't mean it's easy to pull off. Sometimes, one frame can mean the difference between something being successful or not successful. Adding in other factors such as lag and nervousness means sometimes there's no clear answer to everything. But as long as you have the basics of frame data and you combine that with your own fighting game instincts, you should be on your way to developing a solid playstyle against every opponent that comes your way. I feel that the payoff to applying frame data to your game is that Tekken all of a sudden becomes less about guessing and luck, and more about reactions, reads, adaptation, and execution. So I highly encourage you guys to slowly incorporate frame data into your style of gameplay and combine it with what you already know. This is how the things in this video will really stick. So, keep on practicing, and good luck on your Tekken journey!